Hello, everyone, and welcome to the Smith School. We are so pleased to have you here today for the launch of a document we've been working on revising uh, for almost two years, uh, a labor of love, a revision to the Oxford offsetting principles for net zero alignment. Today, we have a panelist, um, a panel full of authors. Uh, and of course, we have a much longer author list. Um, we will be taking Q&A at the end. Um, and we are very, very excited to have your questions because uh, it's a very nuanced and very dense document that we're releasing today. If I could have the first slide, we'll jump in. Your co-authors uh, today are just a few of the authors for the Oxford Offsetting Principles Revised 2024 version. If we can go to the next slide, we can acknowledge the great interdisciplinary panel um, it's first my pleasure to introduce to you Professor Nick Ayer. Nick Ayer is uh, thankfully uh, still with us today for this panel and very much a, a long-term and forever member of our community, a beloved professor. Um, he has started the Zero Institute, um, but this was also one of his last documents that he worked on in a full-time capacity as uh, Nick has now uh, retired. So Nick, we're so honored to have had you working with us over the last two years on these documents. I think it's important to mention that uh, Nick's work has been dedicated throughout his life to ensuring that the world knows not only uh, how quickly we need to reduce emissions, uh, but how to do it. Um, Nick, over to you to introduce the first principle of the Oxford Offsetting Principles. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Kay, and thank you for those kind words. Uh, can we have the uh, the next slide, please, Jamie? So, Kay, I think Stephen was going to introduce these, wasn't he? Oh yeah, that's absolutely fine. Sorry. <laughs> yeah, I'm I'm happy to take the next three slides, Nick. So I, you know, just laying the context for our attendees today, we're in a moment of of belt tightening with our global carbon budget, and. It, unfortunately, we're we're at a point where our commitment to 1.5 degrees C is unwavering, but we increasingly are seeing the need to have negative emissions and carbon dioxide removal as absolutely essential to achieving climate stability at 1.5 degrees. And, and it's within that context that the Oxford offsetting principles become more important than ever, because we're talking about introducing a new elevated degree of integrity into a series of tools, some of which are carbon dioxide removal, some of which are a broader suite of approaches that will get us to 1.5 degrees C. If I could have the next slide, please. So I wanted to set the stage here before handing it back to Nick. As many of you probably know, the market for nature-based carbon offsets collapsed in the last two and a half years. And, and it collapsed not through oversupply, not through any of the usual things that cause a collapse in a market, but it collapsed because a, a series of reports and, um, and scientific studies finally percolated into the mainstream. And uh, buyers of, of carbon credits began to realize the chronic problems in these markets. This includes uh, supply side only interventions, which lead to very high rates of leakage. We have terrible accounting practices, such as false baseline, uh, issuing repeated credits on the same plot of land. We have non-additional crediting in many different ways. And we've seen increasingly very high risks of reversal, uh, most notably due to wildfires on lands for which carbon credits had been issued. There have been estimates suggesting that uh, certain pools of credit issuances have suffered from overcrediting of 90% or more, meaning that for every 10 credits issued and sold on the market, only one represents an actual unit of avoided or reversed atmospheric emissions. Could I have the next slide, please? And it's within that context that we really hope 
that the Oxford offsetting principles can be part of a broader movement to address this market failure because it's not appropriate for us to throw the baby out with the bathwater, so to speak. So it, it's from that perspective that we hope to reduce risk for investors and developers to rebuild trust uh, between purchasers, sellers, and the general public, to catalyze investment in the next generation of carbon dioxide removal technology, and increasingly encourage differentiation and persistence on both sides of the market meaning that we would like to see this chart on the right side of your screen inch upwards, driven by a new generation of verifiable high integrity carbon offsets. And with that, I'll pass it over to Nick. Thanks so much, Stephen. I just wanted to mention that uh, Stephen Lezak is not just with us as a Smith School scholar. He's also uh, a scholar in adaptation, looking in Native communities in Alaska. And I think it's really important to have us frame this debate in terms of these adaptation challenges. Offsetting is a, a challenge, and some of the challenges to offsetting are because we are living through climate change currently. Um, Stephen, thank you so much for opening. Uh, over to you, Nick. Thanks, Kaya. Can we uh, have the next slide, please, uh, uh, Jamie? So um, uh, it's an obvious statement. I'm going to make it anyway, that the, the challenge of delivering net zero is enormous, um, but we do think that it's it's achievable. Um, this slide shows three different scenarios that uh, uh, the, the IPCC um, looked at. Uh, and as you can see, they're all net zero compliant. Um, but the pathways are quite different. So we are we do have to uh, deal with uncertainty when we're thinking about the pathways to net zero. But there are two important commonalities in, in the scenarios. The first is the need for very large and rapid reductions in emissions. That particularly, of course, therefore means fossil fuel emissions, the, the, the yellow uh, block on, 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 on these diagrams. So that's one commonality. <laughs> And the second, for the reasons that Stephen set out, is that we will need significant removals uh, from mid-century and into the second half of, of the century. They look at rather small on these diagrams, but, but they are still billions of tonnes of, 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 of removal, so very significant. Um, they can come from uh, nature-based um, uh, uh, removals and storage or, 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 ge or geological storage. And, and my colleagues are going to talk more about those choices later. I'm going to focus now just on the issue of uh, reducing emissions. So COP28 took a big step forward in the so-called UEA consensus, recognising the need for a transition out of fossil fuels. Uh, but to do this while providing a good standard of energy services for the whole world will require huge growth in both renewable energy and energy efficiency, the so-called energy transition. The, the range of actions and the scale of investment we needed to achieve this go across the economy, across society. There is no way that voluntary offsets uh, can clearly do this alone. So our, our first principle really is about uh, the positioning of uh, offsetting as part of the solution, but, but far from the whole solution. Can we go to the next slide, please, Jamie? So this is our principle one. Um, for everyone, for the reasons I've set out, reducing your own emissions needs to be the top priority. The energy transition will eventually enable most organizations to deliver uh, their own net zero by reducing their own emissions to zero uh, without any offsetting for most organizations, but not all. So offsetting can't be central, but it can play a role both in removals and emissions reductions. Uh, and that's because for many actors, particularly in the, in the global South, finance will be a key constraint in the energy transition uh, financial resources available through the offsetting market should be able to help that. Uh, and one of the key changes that we've made in this revision of the principles is that they now recognise the role that investment in emissions reductions credits uh, can play in emissions reduction up to and beyond the date of net zero. So reduce your own emissions first. If the emissions can't be avoided, 
then uh, offsetting um, c- c- comes into play. It shouldn't need to be said, but unfortunately it does, uh, that those offsets need to be robust. They need to be transparent. They need to follow best practice and they need to stay updated in line with best practice. So that's our principle one. In short, it says prioritize reducing emissions, get them to zero if you can. Uh, But even whether you can or not, there's still more that you can do through a robust credit market. Um, Thanks, Kaya. Thank you very much, Nick. And I think before going to our next speaker, it may be worth mentioning that we had a debate. We like to uh, debate things in Oxford rigorously. Um, and, and we also like to bring those debates out into the public um, because of how worried we are about sort of the, the moral delay potential of uh, relying too heavily on offsetting. And because of some of the errors and, and challenges in the offsetting market um, that Stephen mentioned earlier, we even had a debate about whether it's appropriate for us to continue using the word offsetting. But we also want to acknowledge the science of net zero and the need to scale removal capacity. Um, And so it's important for me to introduce our next speaker, Eli Mitchell Larson. Um, There's probably no one who I think cares more about or or who has done more in the Oxford ecosystem to help scale and uh, provide the governance system for the removal uh, space in Europe. Um, Eli is the chief science and advocacy officer and co-founder of Carbon Gap. Um, and Eli is also a scholar with us in Oxford. Eli, can you share why principle two is so important and perhaps maybe even why we maintained the frame around offsetting? Thank you, Kaya. Thanks everybody for joining. So principle two in in the big picture is is not so dissimilar to as we originally envisioned it in the first launch, although we've made some important revisions. And really it says that of that portion of climate action that Nick's already said has, you know, we, it's been preceded by emission reduction. So in a mitigation hierarchy, those who are looking at the Oxford principles, we are assuming have already done everything they can to reduce their emissions and in fact, invest in the green transition in other ways outside of these compensation claims and offsetting. So now to that hopefully relatively small chunk of climate action that entities might be performing using carbon credits, what characteristics must those carbon credits adhere to? Principle two is really about that gradual shift that needs to happen towards ultimately exclusively removal carbon credits. That's because at the at the net zero date, only a, a physical balance of emissions out and removals back in uh, can actually deliver that uh, durable and sustainable net zero state where climate impacts are are mediated. And indeed, of course, it'll be increasingly necessary for organizations to deliver on an organizational basis net negative emissions, which of course can only be conducted with removals. It is worth noting that there is a massive removals gap in the universe of carbon credits. The Berkeley Carbon Trading Project and other trackers, including some work that we did at Carbon Direct, attempted to kind of collect the entirety of all carbon credits and something like three to 4% of them are unambiguously removals. The other 96% are avoided emissions and emission reduction carbon credits. And in fact, there's even still some ambiguity about what some credits are. If you take improved forest management or a few other examples of carbon projects, they deliver a mix. And so what we're really calling for is crystal clarity about whether a carbon credit represents an emission reduction or a carbon removal. And within that portfolio, on the journey and transition towards a net zero alignment, a shift towards removals. Now, one final comment on on the character of those removals. Carbon removals span a a vast array of both so-called conventional methods, things like forestation and more novel approaches like enhanced rock weathering, ocean alkalinization, biochar, you name it. And those different methods have vastly different characteristics and different costs that will come up in principle three in a a big way related to permanence. But I just wanted to point out that based on different carbon removal methods are are appropriate for compensation claims to varying degrees. And and we know that there's open system methods where the carbon is stored in a vast ecosystem. We don't necessarily know where that specific molecule went and so-called closed system methods where it's very clear the the carbon uh, the climate benefit is very 
relatively straightforward to quantify. So it's important to, to consider those different characteristics and also the co-benefits. So all kinds of non, non-climate benefits and costs are imposed by different removal methods. And we have to take those into account, especially in the context of building a net zero aligned carbon credit portfolio for making these uh, these compensation claims. I think I'll wrap there and I believe back to Kaya to principle three. Thank you so much, Eli. I just want to underscore some remarkable analysis that you shared there that the carbon market has hardly any carbon removal in it at all. I think that's a little known fact. And I think that is one of the main drivers for me uh, for continuing to work on these principles. Um, next, I want to hand over to uh, Audrey Wagner. Audrey leads uh, the program for nature-based solutions uh, with uh, Dr. Natalie Seddon, who's also a co-author on these principles. Um, and Audrey has been just an incredible peer teaching us about how the nature-based solution space can help uh, improve uh, the integrity of nature-based carbon credits. And um, Audrey, I'm going to I'm going to hand over to you to consider uh, for the audience what principle three means when we talk about moving towards long term removal and storage capacity. If we could go to the next slide and introduce Audrey. Super. Thank you so much, Kaya, for that introduction. It's really my pleasure to introduce principle three um, today and talk about the revisions that we made um, to, to this kind of new addition. So principle three is really to shift towards removals with a low risk of reversal. We know that CO2 has a lifetime of thousands of years in the atmosphere, and thus the science tells us that any removals which are being used to counterbalance residual emissions must be stored durably, also on the timescale, of course, of millennia in order for us to reach and especially maintain net zero. So it's obvious that if a credit is used to offset an organization's emissions um, and, and that credit is reversed, for example, by a forest fire or drought, um, then that credit is, is no longer valid, right? And of course, that's a problem. So while the previous edition used the language of short-term versus long-term storage when talking about principle three, one of the most critical changes that we made in this update is moving towards a language of risk. So referring um, instead to a risk of reversal and really trying to exemplify a gradient instead of, of, of a binary. So all projects will inev inevitably carry some risk of being reversed, uh, of that carbon being re-released back into the atmosphere. But the principles shed light on which types of storage may have higher or lower risks and how, critically, how we can mitigate some of these risks. So looking at our figure one over here, we can see that we've distinguished between both biological and geological um, storage types. And this is a helpful way to think about things, though, of course, some projects will fall in, in the middle of these two types. So starting actually with the right side of the diagram, so um, the box five, where we, where we have carbon removal to the geosphere, we can see that geological storage, storage tends to have quite a low risk of reversal. So there have been instances of geological res reservoirs leaking, and these need to be monitored over, over, monitored over the long term. But we can see the risk of reversal bar at the bottom um, tend, that tends to have quite a low risk of reversal. Moving a bit more towards the left, looking at the middle of, of the blue box here, we can see um, examples of project types that involve biological remover, removals and storage, but these potentially also have quite a low risk of reversal. And so these are nature-based solutions that when they restore and protect the carbon stored in well-managed, resilient ecosystems can also potentially store carbon for centuries to millennia provided future generations continue to maintain them and that they're not destabilized by future climate change. And so good governance, adaptive management, healthy ecosystems with high biodiversity and the equitable participation of indigenous peoples and local communities can all help to mitigate this risk of reversal and to ensure longer durability. 
Moving more towards the left of the blue box, we have projects that have a relatively high risk of reversal. So we can see the risk of reversal bar, it's getting less green into the kind of white shading, right? And so this could include afforestation projects that is planting trees where trees did not naturally occur. So for instance, in other ecosystems like savannas and peatlands, um, or it could include monoculture plantations of non-native species. It can include um, plantations used for bioenergy capture, um, uh, yeah. Um, and so, so these projects, um, particularly the, the afforestation projects and the monocultures, not only do they have a high risk of reversal, but they also have very little co-benefits and they can instead cause harm to biodiversity and local people and must be avoided. So we can see that both within project types, so within um, the uh, biological and, and um, geological types, there, there, and also between them, there are different uh, potential risks of reversal and different co-benefits, as well as different trade-offs. Another critical point that we wanted to emphasize in this revised edition is that just because a project might not have a very low risk of reversal, but maybe it has, say, a moderate risk of reversal, it doesn't automatically mean that the project shouldn't be invested in. So firstly, there are many other reasons to invest in supporting high quality projects that produce a, a, a wide range of benefits. Um, so this would include carbon storage, but it can, it can also include enhancing biodiversity and supporting local livelihoods, right? And and so therefore we've added, to emphasize this, we've added these co-benefit bars that, that, that you can see here that Eli also mentioned. So in general, while geological storage tends to have a low risk of reversal, biological storage, particularly high quality nature-based solutions, so kind of that middle category, tends to have more co-benefits in terms of the other ecosystem services that can be delivered by that project. So these are two things to consider, both the risk of reversal, but also the co-benefits um, at the same time. Uh, secondly, continuing to invest in high integrity projects with a moderate risk of reversal for, so for instance, um, nature-based removals that, that may be susceptible to climate change, this will also play a valuable role in the short to medium term while complementary approaches, so for instance, um, DAX uh, with a lower risk of reversal are developed and deployed, right? Um, so there can kind of be a, a shift over time. Um, as well. So the risk of reversal is something that should be carefully considered, that should be managed, and that should be especially monitored over long periods of time, longer than, than it is currently being monitored. Um, another addition that we have to, to, to this revised version is the um, addition of some, some language, some discussion around the role of setting separate nature and biodiversity targets. So long, credible net zero commitments, it's also critical for organizations to set separate targets around halting and reversing biodiversity loss, um, that these would be in addition to, to net zero credits. Um, this kind of brings us into talking about um, what we've included around beyond value chain mitigation. And I think Inji, who's the next presenter, will talk more about that. So I'll leave it at that for now, but looking forward to answering questions. Thanks so much. Thank you so much, Audrey. You got the, the complex slide. I think we worked on this graph for many, many hours. And what we really wanted to bring out was the complexity of the ecosystem and help to kind of give people an understanding of how different types carry different risks and different benefits. And I hope that that uh, is clear. But if you would like to dive into the document, um, there will be more. If we can go to the next slide. Um, uh, one more. Um, the next slide shows the sort of portfolio approach. Uh, and this is something we, we want to be very clear that this slide uh, is not necessarily to scale or, or exactly prescriptive. We've had people actually taking out rulers to a version of the, uh, an earlier version of this slide to try to measure uh, exactly how they should create a representative or proportional portfolio, which is very, very flattering. But it is, of course, these are principles. It is, of course, up to the user to consider how they build their portfolio. But this slide helps us to illustrate how we begin moving from removals with low risk of reversal and from perhaps the avoided emissions that we see largely in a market towards these uh, longer term removals with uh, lower risk of reversal. 
Um, so I wanted to pass over to Inji Johnston. Um, Inji has joined us actually since the, the first introduction of the principles as our offsetting fellow. We, had, we received such demand for research and engagement on this, on this research area that we created a role uh, for uh, one of the best scholars I know. Inji, can you tell us a little bit about principle four and about how we might even be able to um, to create a shift like this in a portfolio? Is it possible today to kind of be on the right side of this figure? Is it possible to create a portfolio with 100% low risk of reversal projects? Or are there other things that we need to do to get there? Wonderful. Thank you so much, Kaya. And uh, it's a delight to be here um, and talk through these things. Yeah, well, one of the one of the first things about this figure is, I guess, it is that acknowledgement that you know these principles are high level, but ultimately, it's really important that they're applied out there in the marketplace. And so, by providing this illustration of what a net zero aligned offsetting strategy looks like, we're really trying to encourage uh, the uptake of them and this kind of um, real translation of the theory to practice. And so, many of you will recognize this figure um, from the original principles, but there are a few important changes that we've made um, that I'll talk through. So one change that might jump out immediately is that we have adjusted the proportions in the portfolio. Uh, so previously it had a lot more avoided emissions and kind of emissions reductions, and, and there has been that shift to carbon removal. And this is, again, just illustrative that this is just an indicative portfolio. It is not a prescriptive portfolio, but it's also recognizing that there has been an immense shift uh, in a number of leading actors' strategies to even 100% removal offsetting already. And so we are starting to see this shift, this transition, and it's important to acknowledge that. And so we have adjusted the proportions there. We have also added this really important section uh, above the line, above um, 100%, where actors can make a contribution rather than a compensation claim. And so this is the role for kind of additional beyond value chain mitigation. And I'll come back to that in principle four. But, you know, this is really important because as actors, we have different means and different abilities to be able to implement net zero aligned offsetting strategies. And so it's really important that all actors that can should go faster and, and, you know, expand their ambition in this area. Now, perhaps the most important part of, of this figure, and one thing that, you know, was really did get come across last time, is that this is a transition over time. So we are not expecting, you know, fully net zero aligned offsetting portfolios overnight. But what we are expecting to see uh, and already have seen, as I said, um, since 2020 and since the original principles, is this clear pathway. And this pathway, as you'll see, is smooth. It doesn't have a sudden jump up. It's not abrupt. And that requires some planning because, you know, the market simply doesn't have the scale available right now uh, because it is really difficult, especially uh, to build out some of the more durable end of the carbon removal supply chain. And so it's incredibly important all actors kind of really embrace and consider the, the full enormity of kind of what it means to implement a net zero line offsetting strategy and what that means for them in their business practice today. So with that, I'll ask to, to switch to the next slide and to, to go to principle four, please. Wonderful. So here we have principle four, which is to support the development of innovative and integrated approaches to achieving net zero. Now, this is one of the principles that has shifted in wording uh, since the original principles. And again, we feel this is really important because over the last few years, we have seen an immense array of different levers that we've seen actors deploying to shift towards net zero aligned offsetting strategies. Now, for space reasons, we, uh, you know, only indicated a few levers, but I will talk through them because I think they um, provide some real context to what we mean when we say innovation and, and what we mean when we say adopt an integrated approach to your net zero aligned offsetting strategy. But I guess first and foremost, it's just important to reiterate that, you know, principle four, uh, up until principle four, we've really been talking about uh, the demand side, you know, what actors can look for when they're going to procure these um, removals. But ultimately, so much also depends on the supply side. And as, as Eli mentioned, we have a significant carbon removal gap. And so it's really important that actors actively co-create the kind of supply that they need uh, in the future. And so different elements of this are spelled out on the slide here. So first we see using long-term agreements 
that are both bankable and investable to provide that certainty to project developers so that they can raise capital efficiently, they can get these kind of loans to build out this infrastructure, because it is infrastructure, it costs significant sums of money. And we've seen some great examples of this, the first being the next gen facility, uh, which seek to uh, sought to procure 1 million carbon removal units back in 2022. We've also seen Frontier, which has made an over 1 billion US dollar commitment to purchasing carbon removal. And these are really significant strides. And so we, we commend these and also seek to um, encourage their further development. We also see de-risking project finance more generally. And, you know, it's also important um, this is perhaps the first time we've touched on this, that these principles aren't just for kind of corporate actors. We really do see a role for all actors in the ecosystem, public and private, having a role in implementing these principles. And again, so de-risking project finance can sit both with government and, and with companies as well. And so, you know, we've seen, again, an array of initiatives um, in the past few years in this uh, direction. We see, uh, for example, 45Q come out in the US, uh, which is paying up to 180 US dollars per tonne for a direct air capture uh, credit to really plug that gap in project financing to be able to make these projects viable, particularly while they're at their nascent and very early stage. We also have forming uh, sector-specific alliances. So the Race to Zero has been uh, a real leader in this space and has created a number of sector-specific alliances. And these are really important to kind of lean into and embrace, and particularly from the offsetting angle, because, you know, as principle one emphasizes, any offsetting strategy begins with the emissions reductions. But so too does the offset, you know, the very offsets that we seek to procure. And so, you know, we really encourage um, actors to, to join their sector specific alliance, lean into this. And I'd also say that um, the newly released uh, Transition Planning Task Force has some really good sectoral specific guidance in this regard, which again also includes that offsetting piece. Next, we have supporting the protection and restoration of a wide range of ecosystems in their own right. So one thing that we have been seeing is that uh, Actors increasingly recognize that nature targets are important, biodiversity targets are important, and net zero targets are important, and have been trying to kind of kill two birds with one stone. And we really do want to emphasize that in a lot of ways, nature needs to be protected in and of its own right, separate from any kind of offsetting contribution that it can make. And again, this is really um, an important aspect to consider as part of some additional beyond value chain mitigation. Next, we have adopting and publicizing the principles and incorporating them into regulations and standard setting for net zero. And again, this is an area where there's a role for both public and private actors. On the public side, we can see incorporation into bills and regulation. And increasingly, we're starting to see that this come through. For example, uh, SB 308 out in California is, you know, one of the first bills to really clearly lay out that trajectory to what 100% carbon removal offsetting looks like. And so they step through from 1% in 2030 right through to 100% in 2045. And obviously there's caveats about availability and supply, but it's really powerful that we're starting to see this clear line of sight towards where we need to go. And similarly, we have seen some companies uh like adopt and adapt these principles. And that's been really exciting too, because, you know, it, it's really important that uh, that more actors are aware of what a net zero aligned strategy is, and also are actively taking these steps to implement one. And finally, and just quickly, we have investing in additional beyond value chain mitigation. And so this is part of recognizing that offsetting is no longer a zero sum game. And we do need to be thinking very carefully about how we curate our strategies and how we can importantly raise ambition, particularly for the many actors uh, that do have greater means to be able to do so. And finally, just again, a reminder that this list is not exhaustive. We have been really impressed by the array of really creative kind of initiatives that have sprung up in recent years and uh, will continue to kind of uh, watch and support this space with great interest and enthusiasm. And so with that, I will hand back over to Kaya. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Inji, uh, and for all of your work on the updated principles. I think the um, the careful watchers on this webinar may have noticed that our principles foundationally have not actually changed very much. Um, if anything, we're drawing a line under them and saying that the time to follow these principles has only become even more urgent. Um, we have to scale removal capacity something like a thousand fold, and we have a crisis of integrity in the carbon market that we need to solve. 
And so the first question that we got from the panel, and I'm going to um, send it across to all the panelists in a moment, so just think about this now, is why, given these challenges, have we uh, continued to stick with the term offsetting? And I'll make a small plug for a debate that we're hosting on this very uh, topic later in the afternoon at the Oxford Martin School. Um, but the answer, I think, is, you know, I, from my perspective, it's calling a spade a spade. Ultimately, there will be residual emissions in very hard to abate sectors and in only the very hardest to abate sectors around the mid-century target date for net zero. And we will very likely have to rely on removal and storage capacity to counterbalance those. So whether you call it an offset or a balancing mechanism, uh, it's clear that we have quite a lot of work to do. And principle four in particular sets out a path for how we not just react to the market and act as passive buyers in the market, but how we create the outcomes-based market that we want from a climate science perspective and not just allow the market to move with the lowest price as king. So I want to move to our final slide, which is a summary of how we've seen some of the principles in the past uh, being misused. Given that we have largely kept with our foundational principles, providing important updates to the science and in line with the new governance around net zero, um, why are we providing a clarification? We see some actors in the market um, aligning to parts of the principles while perhaps cherry picking and not choosing uh, to align with the rest. So we wanted to kind of outline quickly before we go to Q&A, five clarifications for how to apply the principles. Um, first, it's that each of the four principles are critical. Uh, they come as a package. Um, you can't do really net zero aligned offsetting without reducing first, making sure that you are actually in need of that offset. Um, you can't do it without moving towards removal and starting to scale uh, removal capacity. You can't do it and mean you certainly can't maintain net zero without long term durable storage. And we're not going to be able to have that removal capacity with long term and durable storage unless we follow principle four and some of the steps that NG outlined around being really active players in this market. Um, we also see that there are some actors in the market who feel that they've done uh, you know, part of what we've suggested and they're able to claim net zero. Perhaps they've reduced emissions as far as they could in this year and they've bought up credits in the equivalent amount. Um, some uh, might be doing that and claiming carbon neutral and others are claiming net zero. The EU has recently passed legislation suggesting that uh, it might be illegal to claim carbon neutral or climate neutral, um, especially uh, before you're ready. Um, and so I think really we really caution actors not to make claims um, before meeting internationally agreed net zero standards, such as the SBTI or the ISO net zero guidelines. The race to zero has some minimum criteria uh, across different uh, partner organizations. We mentioned these because uh, in 2020, when we initially wrote the Oxford Offsetting Principles, there were no internationally agreed standards on what net zero means. We also want to mention that following the principles around net zero aligned offsetting is A, it's not a standard and we're not going to audit anyone. And B, it is not sufficient for a whole net zero strategy as we're seeing the transition plan space emerging so quickly in such an important area of governance for net zero. Um, you have to look beyond our principles. <laughs> we It's a, just a, a six page document. Um, finally, uh, we have seen some actors um, using the taxonomy in a very descriptive way. They say, oh, look, we've got kind of all of these different offerings in our portfolio. We've got a nice diversified portfolio or we're, we're using some of them. But that taxonomy is really intended to show you to help you make careful decisions and around how to move towards removals with durable storage. It's not just descriptive. It's not just a way to kind of describe business as usual and then say you're aligning to the principles. Um, we also want to uh, emphasize something that is actually um, an area where we see lack of convergence in the standards landscape. And I think there's an opportunity, and I engage in standards and that zero often, for us to help clarify this space. The mitigation hierarchy, which may be familiar to, to most, um, says that you should prioritize uh, reduction. You know, it's basically principle one. 
Um, but a lot of people interpret this as a sequence that we should worry about reduction and then worry about removals later. The likelihood is, however, that we're going to need to scale our removals capacity if we want to be able to rely on those kinds of innovations, technologies, uh, capacity and uh, nature um, restoration in the future. So you should probably be investing now if you think that your sector is in a space where it's likely to have residual emissions. So it's not necessarily a first then, but a prioritization. Finally, of course, uh, making a plan to manage risk of reversal. This speaks to what Audrey was saying. Um, offsetting to a ton for ton frame may not be sufficient if there's leakage and there's likely to be some leakage in whatever approach you take. And so you need to have a plan for how to manage that so that you're not passing the buck to future generations to clean up emissions if they're re-released. I'm going to stop there because we've thrown quite a lot of information your way. And of course, the principles have been released today. You're the first to see them. Um, and I'm going to open the floor for a set of longer term questions. And of course, we're here available um, anytime you'd like to ask questions to us as co-authors. Our first question. It's a very important question. Um, for carbon accounting purposes, what should companies look out for when they have to decide if something could be counted as an offset or not? I'm gonna pass this question first to Stephen uh, and hear what he has to say. And I think we'll take one or two other comments on it because I think it's critical. Thanks, Kaya. To be clear, the Oxford offsetting principles are not validating any credits in the market but we're providing a set of principles that will inform purchasers, developers, and validators in turn. Uh, speaking purely for myself and not for all the authors, I think it is oftentimes beyond the scope of any offset purchaser to independently validate a particular offset because it is such a complex task. And we're very encouraged to see a new generation of, of high integrity firms that are coming out and seeking to provide monitoring, validation, and reporting on next generation offsets. And I encourage uh, developers and I, I encourage particularly purchasers to engage with those. I, I will flag, there's also been a question in our Q&A about insurance. And, and I would invite everyone to consider that insurance actually pulls in the opposite direction by creating um, a, a, an incentive for shoddy offsets to persist in the market because they become perceived as safer. And we need to be very careful about the moral hazard there, which is the, the classic problem in any insurance market, going back to Economics 101. And, and so ensuring that developers take responsibility for their offsets and really understand that behind every offset, whether it's high quality or low quality, oftentimes there is an actor feeling as though they're able to admit and not bear any consequences for that admission. And, and so taking that task very seriously and relying on a broader ecosystem of actors here is going to be critical to deploying the offsets in practice. Thanks very much, Stephen. Um, Eli, I think you had some more thoughts on that question and, and others are welcome as well. Uh, I think I think I'm good on that one, but there's a lot of other fascinating questions I'd love to jump in on. Should we do that or do you want to steer it one by one? How about you pick one? It sounds fun. Okay. <laughs> um, an anonymous attendee asks, where can reliable carbon credits be purchased? And I would contend that it's impossible to answer that question. And also one of the critical things we've faced in our policy work with the carbon removal certification framework, it's an EU law that's attempting to kind of codify how carbon removal credit uh, quality floor is established. If someone asks me, you know, what is a high quality credit versus a low quality credit? I have to, I have to answer their question with a, with a question, which is what are you going to use it for? So the, the use of the credit determines what the sort of stringency of quality you're going to apply to it. I could spend one euro per acre to measure soil carbon. I could spend a hundred or I could spend 10,000. 
the amount of money I put into MRV to establish an ironclad climate benefit is a choice. And I would choose that choice based on what's reasonable, based on who's paying for it. Do we want to really impose farmers with such severe bureaucratic hurdles to measure the soil carbon? So oftentimes I think about working backwards from what is a reasonable amount of MRV insurance, all of these kind of instruments to apply to a given type of carbon storage and working backwards from what's reasonable in the real world, what use is that carbon credit? And if the only reasonable amount of monitoring and, and insurance and just, you know, black and white clarity that, that one ton of climate benefit has been delivered, if that burden needs to be quite light, then maybe it's not appropriate to be used for compensation. So there is no black and white rule about good offset, bad offset, sorry, good carbon credit, bad carbon credit. There is only, what are you going to use it for? What claim are you going to make? And and working backwards from that, we can determine scientifically what, uh, what level of scrutiny we, we want to apply to it. Thanks very much, Eli. And I think you've brought out an important distinction that we make in these principles, which is that there's a difference between an offset, a credit, and a project, right? Um, credits don't have to be offsets. And I think this is something that we you know, worked very closely together with Nick and the team. There are other reasons that people might use the, the credit market to help perhaps um, help others reduce their emissions and acknowledging kind of equity principles around how we need to efficiently help others uh, draw, remove, reduce emissions. And that might be happening even past the net zero target date, but it wouldn't necessarily be a compensation claim associated with that. Nick, we've got a question here kind of tied to that around climate positive. Um, what, what do you think about kind of net zero at a system level? Yeah, I mean, I think that is the, it, it's the right starting point. I mean, we, we don't actually need any individual act. Well, we need some individual actors to be uh, to be at, at, net, net, at net zero or better by the date of net zero. But it's extremely improbable that every actor will be net zero aligned by the date of, of, of net zero. In particular, very large amounts of emissions come from households and they are not going to sign up to these or any other principles. They are just small actors within the system. So the important question is always for it not, am I as an actor net zero aligned? It is, what can I do to help the system get get to be net zero aligned. And that was some of the thinking, as you said, Kaya, behind the idea that um, emissions reduction credits, or is it projects, you tell me which it is, uh, might, might still have a role uh, beyond the date of net zero, because clearly helping people to reduce their emissions, even when the world is at net zero, is going to be a helpful thing to do. So that's what carbon positive, uh, climate positive implies. It implies that in the real world, some people are going to remain climate negative, i.e. have net emissions. Therefore, if we're going to have net zero, other people are going to have to be climate positive. Thanks very much. And we do uh, adapt the definition of climate positive from the race to zero lexicon. You can read those sort of word for word in the updated principles. But I think this raises a really important uh, question and, and debate. You know, um, are we talking about net zero for my organization or net zero for the world? And in this set of principles, we've helped you kind of outline what a credible net zero for my organization uh, claim um, requires. Um, but we also acknowledge that if you are really being kind of thoughtful about it, um, likely it's not going to be that everybody uh, gets to net zero. And so we probably need to go further. Sorry, we have lots of work to do. Um, others who might want to come in on, on this point, because I think it's an, an interesting um, theory of change question. No, okay, we've we've done that one. Um, so I think that uh, something else that has come up in the questions, um, and perhaps, uh, Inji, you could speak to this, um, is how do the Oxford offsetting principles align or differ from the SBTI planned beyond value chain mitigation guidance? And I'm happy to jump in on this as well. <laughs> 
Yeah, wonderful. Thank you, Kai. And yeah, so I've just been answering some <laughs> questions in the comments. And thank you so much uh, to everyone. They've been really high quality questions and really showed this level of engagement, which we're really excited to see. Um, well, so I think actually this question is also better phrased, kind of how does it fit within the, the broader existing status landscape? And so as we highlight in the note from authors, there has been a significant shift in the past few years. We have seen a lot of developments. Um, but at the same time, we are really keen to kind of um, shift for the most ambition and, and kind of, you know, set that clear net zero aligned uh, direction. And we do share that with SPTI and, and their kind of corporate net zero standard that, you know, in setting that, that net zero um, goal. But I would say, yeah, the devil can be in the detail and that we we offer to add kind of a complementary um, framework to how to kind of operationalize these kind of elements Um but that, you know, there is still, um, there are differences in, in level of integrity and in that we do try to set the benchmark here. And so while we reference other standards, you know, there's some, um, yeah, there's some important ways I think that we, ours might go a bit beyond, um, but obviously it's still subject to to seeing that that final guidance. Um, but yeah, keen to hear your thoughts as well, Kaya. Yeah, no, I agree that I think in some ways, principle four goes a bit beyond the value chain mitigation guidance by talking about, say, advanced market commitments or sort of sectoral coalitions um, as ways to um, do sort of beyond value chain uh, mitigation, but that will be critical to any credible offsetting strategy. Another, I think, important distinction to try to draw out, which I would think is largely semantics between um, what we're saying and what SBTI has said, is that they intentionally don't use the term offsetting because they think that that term has come with kind of too much mud or it, it's... Um, it's just, it's a messy term. People interpret it different ways. Maybe the, the sense of absolving guilt is too strong in that term. And again, you know, um, but, but largely what they're saying is the same as us, that to achieve net zero, you need to really follow um, kind of 1.5 aligned pathways uh, in terms of emissions reductions. Um, and, you know, you have to really consider if it's hard to abate. And then if you want to counterbalance those, or I think they use the word compensate uh, or neutralize, um, different ways to say the same thing, it has to be long-term uh, removals. And so we're saying the same thing ultimately about offsetting in the path to net zero. I think they've just chose not to use the term offsetting. And then they're saying the beyond value chain mitigation guidance is an opportunity um, to do more and to use the credit market to do more. Uh, and I think that's similar to what we're saying. You know, you, we probably should be doing more and using the credit market with only high integrity credits to do more. But I think Eli has uh, a thought there. Yeah, maybe just to build on on Kai and G's comments, I think there's there's a, there's a semantic problem with the word residual because it has two possible interpretations. You could interpret it to be temporally residual. What's left after I've done every single thing I could do? So it's 2040 and I've successfully reduced my emissions by by 90%, think, as SPATI told me to. Now I've got to go buy carbon credits. Where are they? Well, there are no carbon credits, perhaps, because there wasn't any demand earlier to build up the supply. And so that, that sort of temporally residual interpretation uh, I would say is problematic. And, and the other way to think of residual is, if you think about it, every time a calendar year ends, all the emissions that we emitted sort of become residual emissions. They're kind of grandfathered in and we kind of accept, whoops, the 2023 emissions are locked in now. So I think we have to realize that residual emissions are any emissions we continue to emit. And the real question, therefore, is what is difficult to decarbonize? As I think we've answered in the chat in a few spots, it's a moving target. What is difficult to decarbonize changes over time. It changes by sector, and you know, at a certain point, we kind of have to accept that there's a there's a cost element here. And I would also uh, I would open up this this uh, thinking that we've been trying to advance a carbon gap a bit around kind of ability to pay. So thinking less in terms of you know what kind of carbon credit is the company buying and how many dollars or pounds per ton is it. But what if you just look at different corporate profits and divide them by total emissions and you suddenly see that there are some sectors that are that are making in profit hundreds and hundreds of thousands of pounds for every ton they emit. What is their fair share climate contribution? You could easily argue it's quite a lot more than 100 pounds a ton, maybe if it's more than 1000 pounds a ton. So we have to, to Nick's point as well, we have to think in terms of how do we structure actual policies, really, anything we're leaving up to voluntary action is is already a huge uh, failure, right? And and so if we can encourage more of that theoretical ability to, to pay for climate to go towards these activities, 
that's going to be really important. And, and I think for some organizations, there really are no residual emissions, or, or rather, they, they could immediately eliminate a lot, a lot of those emissions and buy quite expensive, quite high quality carbon credits. Thanks very much, Eli. Yeah, and, and the ISO net zero guidelines uh, define residual as perhaps different from anything remaining. Residual is tied to, in that standard, truly hard to abate emissions kind of at around the net zero target date. And so I think that is an important distinction where net zero is not carbon neutral. Net zero is not something that you just kind of claim once you think you've offset uh, your um, remaining emissions in this year, even if you have tons of work to do, reduce your emissions. Um, I want to turn a question over to, to Audrey. Under principle three, you mentioned afforestation with non-native species. Where would you put that uh, afforestation uh, with native species on the risk spectrum? Sure. So the first thing I'd say is that it's really hard to generalize because it'll be case by case. It'll really depend. It'll be um, yeah, specific to the project, specific to the area, specific to the ecosystems and the species um, that, that are being planted. Um, it's important to realize that the definition of afforestation is um, planting trees where trees did not naturally occur. So then it kind of begs the question, well, what what native species um, really? That's one thing. Um, but then also thinking about is the ecosystem very degraded? Um, has climate change affected the area? Um, and kind of what, yeah, what what the impact of these these species are having on the biodiversity of the area. Um, but of course, there can be times where afforestation can be um can be quite quite good. So for instance, an urban areas, right? So if we're planting trees in urban areas, okay, maybe they don't naturally occur in these types of landscapes. Um, but um, that's kind of a, a different story. So something to kind of think about when we're when we're thinking about afforestation. Thank you, Audrey, for that expert knowledge. Um, I'm going to ask Stephen, um, our final question, we might have time for final remarks after that, what should companies look out for when they have to decide if something could be counted as an offset or not? Thanks, Kaya. The The way I interpret this question, which I hope will be most helpful to our attendees, is when looking at the emissions under which you exert some influence, whether we think of that as scope one, two, three, or beyond, what should be eligible for offsetting and what really needs to be um, uh, directly mitigated. And it's a shame that the that the carbon market as we know it has collapsed today because if the carbon market were robust, it would be largely an issue of matching um, the cost of an offset with the marginal abatement cost of any given unit of emission. And the market would get to, to a certain extent, decide what do you offset and what do you directly abate. So theoretically or hypothetically, if you had some source of emissions that would cost you $1,000 a ton to abate, you would, even today, you'd say, I'm going to buy a high quality uh, offset or a high quality removal. Uh, you would invest in something that would be much cheaper. And you would feel good knowing that you had made the economically efficient decision. And with that surplus, we would hope that maybe you would um, send that over in a, in a contribution toward beyond value chain mitigation rather than spend $1,000 to mitigate one ton of CO2. Now, because the market has collapsed, companies essentially have to engage in their own carbon shadow pricing as they make these decisions. And thankfully, there's a robust literature on what that carbon shadow pricing looks like and what form it can take. But I encourage everyone to imagine that we are getting ready, and I shouldn't say imagine, we are getting ready for a time when the carbon market is functioning in a proper, healthy way. And companies will be able to decide what to mitigate and what to offset based on the market price of an incredibly high quality carbon credit. And so going through that exercise now, understanding for the emissions under your control, what is the cost of mitigation is an excellent first step to take. Back to you, Kaya. Thank you. I believe that that's all we have time for today. 
Um, it's been incredible to have you all with us for this launch, and I know there's so much more to discuss. So as we said, our inboxes are open and our report has been released. Thank you for joining us, and we hope to speak with you soon.